All right, next, Dr. Amir Sajipur, I tried, Assistant Professor of Soil Management and Integrated Cropping Systems in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Ag Systems at SIU Carbondale, uh, BS at Amherst, and was a postdoctoral fellow at Virginia Tech and Cornell. Dr. Josh McGrath, Extension Specialist in Ag Soil Management at UK. Primary focus is on applied research and extension in agronomic soil fertility and nutrient management to maximize profitability, efficiency, and protect natural resources. Fascinating stuff. I already interviewed Josh about this, and it's really, I mean, we've got next wave sort of stuff here. So very interesting. Gentlemen. Good afternoon, Illinois. Um, so we're going to give a little bit of an update on our nitrogen research. Uh, we're doing something, you know, a little bit different. So for those of you that aren't familiar, I'm going to kind of go over the methods a little bit. I am going to take this. Oh, it won't let me go far. My eyes aren't good enough to see that screen, so I'm going to have to go from memory. Um, so we're doing something a little bit different with our plot design. Normally you have, you know, seven nitrogen rates and, and four reps in a field just kind of blocked out normal. We're doing everything on farm with producers except for a couple sites at SIU. And so across Kentucky and Illinois, we have three starter nitrogen rates now. This has changed a little bit over the years as we went through and did this. But we have three starter nitrogen rates applied in the two by two with the planter. We're running a four row corn planter. We're using everything RTK GPS, so we pick up the farmer's AB line, start planting, plant across about 50 acres. They pick up our AB line and finish out the rest of the field. So we have three starter rates in the two by two, and then we have seven side dress rates over top of that for 21 different rates that go up to 350 pounds per acre, split apply. But we also have a pre-plant treatment that has, we're putting it down with our planter. We have a sprayer across the back of the planter. We got pumps and tanks all over that four row planter. We're actually thinking about building a shelf to put more tanks and pumps on it. And um, so we have six uh, full season nitrogen treatments so that we can look at a nitrogen response curve if you were putting it down all up front. But then that plot is 20 foot by 120 foot and we split it into quarters. One quarter gets no nitrogen at all. One quarter gets the assigned treatment rate one gets starter only, and new this year in 2021, one gets the starter plus enough nitrogen to take you to 350. So this year we went to a bookend um, kind of approach where we have a zero. Every single plot has a zero embedded in it. And every single plot has a 350 pound per acre embedded in it. And then we have the treatment rate. So we know within that 20 foot by 120 foot area, what the max yield with nitrogen hopefully would be if we don't plateau out at 350, if we don't keep going linear and we have a zero, and we have a starter only, and then we have the treatment rate. And so that's a little bit unique. Um, we, we evolved over time. When we started out, we knew we wanted a zero in every plot. We just had the starter and side dress plus the zero the first year we did this, and then we figured out we could actually do it, and we decided to get a little bit more complex with that subplot structure with four subplots. And so this gives us a wealth of information that I think you wouldn't normally get. So we might have five or six reps in the farmer's field, one of our farmers is into cover crops, so we have three cover crop treatments. So all of a sudden you get six reps, three cover crop treatments, 27 nitrogen rates times four subplots. We've had fields with 2,500 plots in them, right? So it generates a lot of data. The limiting factor in this, if there's any machinery engineers in the room, and I've been beating my friends in ag engineering over the head, is harvest. Harvest, harvest, harvest. I can plant all day, I can side dress. We're side dressing, we have a um, pulse width modulation you know, a cap stand so we can hit, we go from eight gallons to 95 gallons with our side dress unit, and that's how we put down the bulk of the nitrogen. Um, but it's harvest because we have to harvest each one of those plots with a two row plot combine. It takes about seven days running about 20 hours a day to harvest our biggest field site. So that's the limiting factor in how much work we can do. And so we get stuff like this. This is, um, this is a distribution. On the left, the gold kind of colors is the, um, it's, a, it's a probability distribution for yield. So yield on the horizontal axis, um, uh, percent of the plots that fell within that yield on the vertical axis, and the gold bell curve there is our zero end plots, right? And what's amazing is look at the overlap between the gold and the blue, because the blue are the fertilized plots, right? And so when we can, so that this was all designed to look at the spatial variability in soil nitrogen supply. 
because we want to deploy a method to precisely do variable rate nitrogen within the field. There's a lot of variability between fields, but we're really interested in, in, in addressing, kind of looking at the spatial structure of variability within the field, which is largely controlled by soil nitrogen supply. And so we can look at this. So I haven't put the 2021 data in yet. I actually haven't even gotten it from my technician. It takes a, a lot of time to kind of get all this data generated. And this is just one of our small studies. So we haven't really gotten all the 2021. That was a joke. This is not a small study, but we're still working on getting the data out. Um, so there's over 7,000 data points up until 2020. That's how many plots we've put out. And that's after we've dropped two site years that, for whatever reason, were awash. Um, we have uh, 64 site year cover timing combinations that separate out as having separate nitrogen response curves, 64 of those. And, uh, you know, the farmer's managing everything except for nitrogen. And so we can come up with these really crude averages that look pretty good, that um, on average, 37 to 55 pounds per acre of starter nitrogen gets you to about V6 or V8 to side dress, 55 if you've got a, a cereal cover crop up front, 37 if you don't, and uh, 216 pounds of nitrogen will get you 214 bushels per acre on average across our sites. And so that works out to about one pound per bushel of expected yield. And so that would, you know, this looks pretty bad for UK, where our recommendations for all these fields roughly on average were about 185. I'm, by the way, I'm from University of Kentucky, so I, um, but this is the actual data, right? And farmers know this. Like, farmers, I think, really implicitly understand this, and I think we've kind of discounted it in making recommendations from the university. So for a second here, I'm going to be, for the next couple of seconds, I'm going to be pretty critical of what I've done at the university and the recommendations that we make and understanding something. When we talk about the four R's, we talk about rate, timing, placement, and source, right? Four R's, everyone familiar? And, and so we're always talking rate, 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 or timing, timing, timing. The big lever is timing for nitrogen. But, um, you know, we, we, we don't think about the performance objective. And too often, I've sat in a lot of rooms. I'm at Kentucky now. I, I spent a long part of my career in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and um, doing runoff monitoring, not crop stuff, and kind of changed hats when I moved to Kentucky, but um, the performance objective is what matters in the four R's. And so we kind of tell this story that if farmers cut rates, it's good economically and good environmentally, but we are not paying close enough attention to that variability within the field. Performance objective matters, and they're in conflict. The right nitrogen rate to maximize yield is different than the one that protects the environment, and it's different than the one that returns the most on that nitrogen investment. So economics and environment are not hand in hand. You know, if someone's grossly over applying, yes, they'll make more money if they cut rate in, it's better for the environment. But in general, those are conf conflicting performance objectives. And I think we need to be really clear eyed about that when we talk about these things. So how does, how does price influence nitrogen rate? So these are, I pulled out, I think it's, I can't read that from here, 47 site years that fit a quadratic plateau. Not everything works out in the real world like you want it to. So I pulled out the ones that fit a quadratic plateau, and I pulled out only my split applied nitrogen data because I just want to kind of narrow the field here. So the average if you split apply nitrogen across these 47 site year cover preplant nitrogen treatments is 189 pounds per acre will get you 196 bushels per acre, okay? So that's a really crude average, again, just talking average recommendations because that's what we do right now. And so this is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to walk you through. I hope you can see it from out there. On the left, you have a, a graph that shows return on nitrogen, okay? And so this is price of grain times yield minus price of nitrogen times nitrogen rate, right? So just what you have to pay all the bills after you buy your nitrogen. And the red line, this, was, this shocked me. I did not expect this before I plotted it. So this was, I, 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 the last time I checked this, I can't see the date, but I think it was in November sometime was when I pulled these prices, and I stopped tracking fertilizer prices November 22nd or whatever it was. So you can mark that down as the day Josh McGrath gave up. Like I just, the price was, this, that's what they were doing, right? They may have come back down to where they were in November by now. So 94 cents per pound of nitrogen and 554 corn. And... Um, if you look at that red line, 
my alarm's already going off telling me I've, I've gone too long. Um, so that red line is fall of 2021, 94 cent nitrogen, 554 corn. And so the ag if you apply the economic optimum nitrogen rate of 150 pounds per acre, and so I took the first derivative of the quadratic plateau and set it equal to the price ratio of corn to nitrogen. That's how we figure that out. The right rate was 150 pounds per acre, and you would have made $930 per acre off of nitrogen. Exact same yield, different price ratio. August of 2020, nitrogen was 37 cents instead of 94 cents. You'd have only made $6, $640 per acre. You'd have been $300 shy with 30 seven cent nitrogen compared to 94 cent nitrogen. Why? Corn prices went up faster than nitrogen prices in a relative sense. So at the end, so with, with current nitrogen prices, 150 pounds, and, and the interesting thing is, so we say 150 pounds is the right economic optimum nitrogen rate. We talk a lot, you can see that vertical red line is where the economic optimum nitrogen rate is in 2021 or 2022 now. Um, the black line is the agronomic optimum nitrogen rate, the yield maximizing rate that's going to give you that 193 bushels per acre. Even if you apply that, you're making 910 bucks an acre. And if you applied that same exact rate in 2020, you made 640 bucks per acre, right? So all this hand waving about nitrogen prices went up, you've got to cut nitrogen rates. We're doing the wrong calculus because if I'm a farmer, I don't know what the right nitrogen rate is. Do we all agree on that? It's really hard to predict the right nitrogen rate. And so I'm going to apply this year what I applied last year, and this year I'm going to make $300 more per acre after I pay for nitrogen than I did last year. So I feel like I did pretty good, and this holds true even if I apply 200 pounds above the right rate. And so if we want to talk about why we have water quality issues, it's because this year... If you apply 300 pounds per acre and you only need 150, you're going to make $200 more per acre than you did last year if you did apply the right rate. So this gets pretty confusing to me. So what's that doing to a farmer? And I think we need to understand this when we talk to farmers about rate decisions because the risk isn't economic loss because they don't know that they've lost money, right? Because we don't know the rate a priori. The risk is environmental. And that's the sale that you have to make if you want to get closer to the right rate. We've got to stop trying to make arguments that we're saving them money because we're doing the wrong calculus. Our, our plot structure allows us to do a lot of crazy stuff. So this figure is a little bit complicated. But on the left is delta yield. So for every main plot, I have a zero rate and I have my assigned rate. So I can get yield increase at that nitrogen rate. So I took the yield increase over zero pounds of nitrogen, multiplied it times grain price, and divided it by the fertilizer input cost. So this is dollars in grain per dollar of nitrogen for every plot, right, over top of zero N. And so you see at the, that, that vertical line I've got there is the economic optimum nitrogen rate. So I've scaled all the different field sites to their EONR, to their specific EONR. And so that way I can throw them all on the same graph. So that vertical line shows across all the sites their economic optimum nitrogen rate. And the numbers on the bottom are the difference from that. And so you can see even way out to 300 pounds above the economic optimum nitrogen rate, you're above that one-to-one -one line. So you're making a little something on grossly over-applying nitrogen. And if you're growing 300 bushel corn, which a lot of our sites are, if you're making a dollar over your nitrogen cross, then you know, that's $300 per acre, right? And so this year, it's a lot more. Um, this, is, this is a little bit different. This is the difference from the economic optimum nitrate, again, so showed vertically. But just that um, return on nitrogen across that scale. And so this is the other thing that's really interesting. If I'm 200 pounds per acre above the EONR, my range of profitability per acre is definitely smaller. So now I have a risk of underperforming. And if I go left of the EONR, you look down there close to zero pounds per acre of nitrogen applied, you're almost as profitable as you are at EONR. But we can't discern this in the field. We need a technology to be able to discern this. And so to be able to find EONR, which only the, really, the only real benefit we have of applying EONR is environmental, not economic, 
That's what we have to try and figure out. So we're working with sensors. I'm going to cruise to this to let Amir talk. But we're looking at being able to use NDVI through an active on-the-go sensor or using satellite NDVI imagery that's converted to be able to use our equation. We deployed a draft equation this year in our plots. We're going to do it again in 2022. And, you know, it's based on this premise that nitrogen rate is a function of yield response and yield potential. What I'm showing here on the left, left graph, graph is the yield without nitrogen versus the yield with nitrogen. So they're clearly related. That plot immediately next door to one that got nitrogen, you know, yield went up in the zero plot, yield went up in the fertilized plot. The other one is the delta yield between those two on the... Uh, on the horizontal axis and the yield with nitrogen on the vertical axis. Again, there's a relationship between yield response. I always get a little bit of yield as I apply nitrogen. On the really good areas of the field, I get 250 bushels of corn with no nitrogen, 255 with nitrogen. Good areas of the field, get, you know, are, I'm always getting a little bit more. But there's not much relationship between the check yield and the delta yield. And so the equations for NDVI predict the yield with nitrogen and the yield without nitrogen, and they kind of do a calculation every second on the go, and they, they figure out how, what the yield difference is if I fertilize and I don't fertilize, and that graph on the right gives the strategy. The, the low NDVI, small plants get a lower rate, the mid part of the field gets the highest rate, probably above what I planned, and then I drop off on the very best ground where there's less response to, to nitrogen. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Amir so he can show some of his environmental data. Well, thanks, Josh. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Awesome. So, um, as Josh mentioned, um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to kind of link what we are finding to a little bit more of a sustainability environmental standpoint that we are looking for and the project is going into. So, um, in this uh, basically uh, um, slide, what you're going to see is a relation between nitrogen balance and nitrogen rate. Um, the way we calculated nitrogen balance, which is a partial imbalance, is by uh, basically um, making the ba getting the difference between nitrogen applied, that's our nitrogen rates, those are on x-axis, and then uh, whatever nitrogen is removed by the corn, and that's calculated by uh, corn grain yield times nitrogen percent. Uh, we didn't have grain yield, uh, grain nitrogen for every single plot. These are like 7,000 7, data points. But we had uh, enough. Uh, uh, right now, I think we have around like 1,500 to be able to estimate the rest of them. And in the next slide, I'm going to kind of show you like uh, what we use to be able to um, basically estimate the rest of the nitrogen removal rate to be able to calculate these balances. Uh, what I like about balances is like they kind of tell you things. For example, if you look at the, uh, those very lower part, it's like Logan 2019. These are like not all of our sites, but like um, uh, up, up to 2020. Uh, and then you can see that like those Logan one is like operating at a lower level. That kind of shows that how efficient that site was that year to getting a lot of yields with a lower imbalances, okay? So that's kind of like the equation we use to um, basically estimate the nitrogen remo removal for the rest of the plots, and that's only 532 data points, but now we have like a lot more uh, as we are um, adding those data points together. And then we thought, like we were talking with Josh, we thought, okay, what we, we want to show it is that to kind of like balance things out and, and kind of like uh, normalize things. So we took a uh, difference, uh, AONR, which is agronomic nitrogen rate, optimum nitrogen rate, that, that is your yield plateau, right? That's the maximum yield you would get in each, in each side. And then we uh, kind of like uh, put that as, as one of the axes and then we, uh, basically put nitrogen balance on, on, on the y-axis. And then what you can see is this one shows you how inefficient one uh, basically a site could be. Just for example, look at the one on the top. Uh, that's ARC 2020, and that operates in, in, in a lot above. The rest of them, uh, that, that literally needed 1.5 pounds per bushel 
nitrogen to, to get the yield that you want. So that's a different way of looking at it to kind of uh, find those inefficient versus efficient, uh, basically, uh, sites that you're looking for for nitrogen response. So why did we do these nitrogen balances? Because they usually are kind of indicators of excess nitrogen, right? So Andrew Mag Marganot was talking about like phosphorus balances. When you have excess P, for example, or excess N, you expect to have basically excess residual nitrogen in the system that could then um, kind of contribute to environmental and losses, right? So that's what we did, so we put um, not all of our sites, but a bunch of them. Those on the y-axis, end of season end, so that's a residual end after the harvest, versus x-axis, which is nitrogen balance in pounds per acre. And you can see that there was not, uh, surprisingly, not a very good relationship, or not a relationship at all, as we expected to see. So we got, in some data points here, when we have negative imbalances, and also uh, like decent uh, end of season N, versus also at high like N balances and on also um, some high points that had high M, um, basically end of season N. So that was disappointing. So I was like, okay, why don't we look at some of the uh, basically data from uh, experiment station sites and see whether we find better um, relationships. So this is like, I think, six side years um, from 2018 and to 2021. Uh, we looked at uh, basically, again, nitrogen balance on the x-axis, end of season on the y-axis. And if you look at that uh, green, uh, uh, basically, section, what we figure out when we looked at those nitrogen balances, we realized that if you Anytime you hit that optimum nitrogen rate, which Josh was mentioning, like 200, uh, around like uh, basically 200 pounds per acre, that N, uh, basically nitrogen balance was around 100 positive. So 100 pounds per acre positive imbalance. Speaking to the uh, inefficiency of nitrogen, so literally we need to put more, more N to account for the inefficiency of nitrogen to get those optimum nitrogen rates, okay? So here, what we are seeing, those like pop-up data points up there, when you go to that red zone, so that's when we are operating above the optimum nitrogen rate for those sites. Anytime we pass that, we see the potential for hot spots of basically a high end of season that could contribute to end leaching losses in our system. So that's still messy to me, right? So look at when we look at the averages now. It's as beautiful as it can get. That's just ridiculous, right? So now I have uh, basically in the green zone, everything looks really nice down there. The yellow here is my uh, basically um, range of optimum nitrogen rate for all those sites. And then when I go to the red, it's exponential, exponentially increasing. So that's, I think that tells you like that this is so important to do a spatial data analysis. It's so important to try to find those hot spots of nitrogen losses to really reduce the nitrogen, uh, basically, and leaching losses. On the y-axis, uh, on the second, basically, on the right one, you can see the end balances versus the end of season end, and that's, that's kind of like the same scenario. So, so on average, it can explain pretty well. When we put every data point together, it's really messy, right? So all, all that beautiful um, exponential equation come from those high points that we had in the previous slide that contribute to this beautiful line. And that, for this one, actually, that's a winter CRI um, biomass production and corn, after corn harvest. So we went in the field and planted rye after zero nitrogen. So the corn was planted with zero nitrogen 
200 pounds of it as our optimum, economic optimum end rate, and 300 pounds that was excess end. Look at the biomass of winter cereal rye. So we had some, around like more than 1,000 basically pounds per acre. When we were at the optimum, economic optimum nitrogen rate at 200 pounds of N, we had a little bit higher yield, right? That also speaks to an inefficiency of nitrogen because to get to that 200 pounds, we had some excess N balances, right? But then look at what happens when we have excess nitrogen that Josh was talking about. So if you do like 300 pounds of N, because you can, and, and like it makes like sense economically possibly, you get two times more yield, and that translates into two times more nitrogen that is being removed later. So I think it's really important to, first thing is to get the nitrogen rate right, and that's the biggest step forward to managing end of season end. And then, if it's, it's basically beyond those points for sure, the cover crops are doing an amazing job of capturing those. Before that as well, like, so those, are, those could be losses, right? If there was no cover crop there, you could have lost 20 pounds, right? That is being captured here. But it becomes like two times more if you don't get the end right. And then you're basically not taking care of it also with a cover crop in the system. So um, what we're going to do next is that we are like kind of moving to um, basically testing the algorithm as Josh was um, talking about to see how it would work um, in, in basically our strip trials that we're going to do and then uh, uh, also moving towards like uh, doing some nitrogen uh, loss uh, calculations like we're doing quantification of nitrous oxide emission as well as nitrate leaching within those, those trials. Uh, and I think as we are moving forward, like we are, we are getting better at estimating like cover crop biomass, cover crop and uptake. We are building models that predict and release from those cover crops. So I think we can start like m integrating models into our decision systems to be able to do a better job of taking care of those uh, excess N and, and can I account for those nitrogen and do uh, basically do a better job eventually environmentally. Well, with that, I would like to thank you and, and kind of, if you have any questions for us, then more than happy to answer those. No. <laughs> the ones that don't fit had cover crops ahead of that corn. Do you think that's some of the cereal rye releasing nitrogen after harvest? Um, I, it, I just saw that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, what, what we are seeing, actually this one that I showed you guys, when we, that's a part of it, like a larger project, that we have like wheat as a cover crop. Um, so we had corn that we planted with no cover crop, weeds management as like early termination, late termination. And then in, in those, we went and planted rye. And what I can tell you is that those, all of those rye biomasses after wheat were lower. At zero N, 200 pounds of N, and even 300 pounds of N. And I think N was immobilizing N, and that immobilization was going beyond the corn season to this off season, right? So we, uh, if you look at the soil nitrate data are lower, right? And that kind of like talks about any mobilization going beyond. So the funny part is that now we go to the soybeans and we continue like tracking this end. Like what is happening with having wheat before the corn season all the way to soybean that goes after it. And then actually now the soybean yields are a little bit higher in the ones that had wheat before corn than not. And I think there, it's, it's kind of releasing again. So it takes at least a year or maybe more to kind of start releasing N that you would see some benefits in the soybean, possibly. Or it could be not N, I don't know, but soybean yields are more. <laughs>